So when is the most important time to learn how to swim? So when is the most important time to learn how to swim? Is it the time when you are uh, you're, you're ankle deep in the shallow end? Is it the moment you get a little bit deeper? Is it the moment when you dive into the deep end for the first time? Is it the first time to the beach? All of these different times that are pretty important. And I would say, as I heard some people in the back say, when is the most important time to learn? As soon as possible. <laughs> now is always the best time to learn how to swim. And in any situation, it's just good to know how to swim. And I can remember, even for my own kids, we went to the YMCA to teach them how to swim. And, and, and we, even in school now, they have classes to help kids, especially in Florida, because water is everywhere, to teach them how to swim, even without a swimming pool. The basics of how to swim, even without that idea. And so we, I can remember uh, my girls learning how to swim, and it took some time, and it, but it was a wonderful moment when I could trust them in the water, right? But there was a process to it. Now, I don't know, some of you maybe have some intense parents, or maybe you're intense yourself, and you just kind of tossed some, your kid into the deep end. Did anyone learn how to swim that way? God bless you. <laughs> I'm so glad you're still here. And people say miracles don't happen. But that's not necessarily the best way. There's a lot of pain and tension when you learn how to swim in that way. The prayer for this series is that this series can be a life preserver, something that we can throw out to us in the midst of our culture, in the midst of this time and space, because, y'all, we are drowning in the world's opinions, perspectives, and how we talk about sexuality. Sex has been trivialized. Our bodies have been viewed as irrelevant. And the desire for freedom from any boundaries has made it almost impossible to know how to swim in this culture as Christians. And so our prayer is that this can be a lifeline. This can be a life preserver. As you see in the logo behind there, something that you can hold on to, that you can have confidence in and know will support you no matter where you go. And so that's, that's the hope, that's our prayer going into this uh, series, how to be that life preserver. But there's a way in which we desire to do it that is rooted in John 1. Those who are going through the book of John in our small groups probably have already read this, and it has so much important things to us. But John 1 verse 14 says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and what? Grace and truth. Our prayer is that this is not, uh, this, will, this will be a series that is full of grace upon grace, but also with the restorative message of the truth of God's word. And in the church, we have struggled to effectively train our churches to swim in the waters of this culture. And there's a couple reasons. And the first reason that I think is rules are easy. And on this, this conversation of sexuality, tell me, or please don't misunderstand me. There is a time and a place where boundaries are very important. To know what is good for you and what is bad for you is immensely important. And it is, a, it is a way for us as parents, as those who are responsible for young people, to protect them, to actually show them our love by how we care for them in this conversation. So hear me, rules and boundaries are important. But as you grow, I think we all can agree, we can, they become pretty insufficient pretty quickly as we grow into adolescence, as we grow into adulthood. And so for us in this church, the, our church, the American church, the church universal, the early church, the Israelites, we all have struggled in this area. It's kind of like uh, Josh Bonner, who we know and love, he just loves analogies. And so I'm going to steal one of his analogies. He helped me figure out that it's kind of like if you were told that you should make a garden. How many gardeners do we have in here? Okay, 
There's a couple. God bless you. You have so much more patience than I ever do, and I want some tomatoes. I'm calling dibs. Pastoral, uh, I, that was weird. Anyways, <laughs> but if you were told to build or to make a garden, but all you were given was the fence, it'd be a pretty pitiful garden. You weren't given any soil because, let's be honest, the soil in Hernando County really isn't very good. You weren't given any fertilizer. You're not giving a, a shovel. You're not given uh, any seeds even. And what is going to happen is you're going to have a fenced in weed pit. And yet sometimes, if we're honest, that's what we do with this idea of sexuality. We are very clear on the boundaries, but we don't provide the tools. We don't provide the resources. We don't provide the conversation to why so we can have a beautiful garden that produces amazing fruit of God's love in marriage, in healthy marriage. And hear me, this is not going to be a fence series. This is going to be a series that desires to help us in this wonderful world that we live in. The second area is that our situations are unique. We're all coming to this conversation uh, in a very different journey. Your exposure to sexuality is very different. Some, some are in different categories. Some people are single. Some people are dating. And that's important in those seasons. It's marriage. It's so important to know the boundaries, to know what's going on. But it's different when you're married. It's different when you're a widow or a widower. Some people in the room or online have never had a positive sexual encounter in their entire lives. And yet there is deep wholeness and understanding. And even though we come to this conversation in a different, different perspectives and different moments, hear me, we are not going to focus on the whatabouts. Because that's when we have these conversations, we get stuck in the what about this case? What about this case? What about there is a truth that applies across the spectrum, even though it will look different from our perspectives and how that plays out? Does that make sense? Our situations are unique, and that makes us want to avoid this conversation. The next thing is that no one likes to talk about our brokenness. We just don't like to talk about it. We don't like to talk about how we've screwed up, how we've hurt other people, how we've hurt ourselves. It's not a great conversation. It's not a conversation that I want to have, quite frankly, <laughs> as your pastor. But I think as we look at the, 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 the culture that we live in, the truth of God's word, and just the needs of our community, I can't help but not talk about it. It's something that we're all in a struggle with. Purity, even for a pastor, is a battlefield. It's something we all have to struggle, but we can't avoid it because of our own brokenness. And the other thing is, sometimes we're actually uh, thrown off base because of how not subtle God's word is when we talk about this. There are times when I've been through my Bible reading plan, going through the book of Genesis, I've had to pause it because my kids walk in the room. It is not subtle. It is explicit in the conversations of how sexuality has played out in negative ways, but also how we can live in the truth of a healthy sexuality. But the Bible is not subtle. The Bible has a really amazing way of being honest and also honoring. Some of the, the people who do big things for God had deep sexual brokenness. David, Lot's daughters, Solomon, character after character who had deep sexual brokenness and yet did something amazing and that could be honored and somehow God's people are called to hold the tension. So hold the tension with me. Don't ignore the areas where God speaks so explicitly about. We have two hopes, if you're going through the, the notes, two hopes going into this series as Josh and I lead into this. The first, that we pray that this is a bridge and not a barrier. Our sexuality and our brokenness can create a barrier in our faith. Even having this conversation can be very deeply hurtful for some people. And we see you and we know you. We want to come alongside you and to, to support 
every person in this. And there'll be some groups that we talk about that in a little bit. But hear me, the hope and prayer is that this can be a bridge for spiritual growth and not a barrier where we see our own shame and hurt and brokenness. And it prevents us from growing in the Lord. Because as we know, uh, in the title, we talk about restoration. I don't know about anybody else, but if you've uh, been a part of a restoration project, the beginning is a whole lot of mess. And if you see, need to see an example, look at the kitchen for the last month and a half. <laughs> Deeply appreciate everyone in the room that helped it, but let's be honest, half of our fellowship hall has been a hot mess the entire time. And that's how restorations work. It's how projects, sometimes they make a mess. And hear me, if, if this series makes a mess in your heart and your mind, do not be alone. We want to support you. We want to be with you in this conversation. And we have other counselors and support systems that we're going to be talking about throughout this series. But do not allow it to, to, to tear you down. And the other thing is, as this idea of a bridge, this four-week series is not going to answer every question or solve every problem. This is the beginning of a conversation, a continuation of a conversation of how this lives out. And so don't expect this is going to be the by-all conversation. The second goal is clarity, not confusion. And this idea, the goal of this series is to provide clarity where we're not so vague it's not even helpful. We want to be specific, caring for what God cares about, explicit about what God is explicit about in the text. And so today, and that's why we began with this series and that little video of talking about the broad spectrum that I could probably spend a half an hour preaching on, but I'm not going to because I could do a two-minute video about it. It's everywhere in Scripture. But for many of us, we struggle in this conversation because it feels like it's something so new. It feels like it's so out of control, does it not? Am I the only one that feels like it, it's, it's just an out-of-control moment? But actually, we're in the exact same situation as the Corinthian church. Today, we're going to dive into the story of the Corinthian church and Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And remember that we're reading someone else's mail. This is literally a letter written from a spiritual leader to a congregation in a time and a place that holds a deep spiritual truth that we can apply to our lives today because the similarities are amazing. The similarities are so obvious. But today, in this conversation of the Corinthian church, let us hear the shifts that Paul is pushing the Corinthian church and maybe see how we can do the same as well. And so we're going to be reading in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. We're going to kind of work through that. So if you want to find that in your Bible, it's amazing. It's also going to be up on the screen if you would like to read along with me there. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12. And remember, we're hopping into mid-conversation a little bit, so we're going to work through that. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, and I will not be mastered by anything, you say, for food, food for my stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. The Lord for the body. But his power, God raised the Lord, but by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. And so the shift that we see in this moment, and this is the midst of a conversation, pretty much chapter 5 through 12, and if I had a little more time, I probably could it's really Paul speaking truth into their culture and what does it mean to play out in a lot of different ways and one of them is sexuality. But the main shift that Paul is doing in this moment is this truth that our silence speaks volumes. Silence in this moment when talking about sexuality, I don't know about you, but a lot of my life, it's been something that you just put under the rug because it's messy, it's dirty, it's not something we want to talk about, it makes everyone feel uncomfortable. Anyone else have that? <laughs> yes. But what we see here is Paul bringing all the skeletons out of the closet. <laughs> 
He's bringing everything out into the open in a communal letter. Hear me, this is to the church. It's not to an individual. It's not to the leader. It's to everybody. He's calling everyone to account for what is going on. And sometimes when silence, it speaks volumes in helping us, helping other people or giving other people the perspective that we, one, are insecure in our answers. Anyone else feel that way when your parents were silent about something It made you feel like, maybe I should be insecure about that? Secondly, our silence speaks volumes to think that we don't actually have an answer, and so we avoid it. But what Paul is doing is drawing us, bringing us into this moment. And we see two uh, phrases that really are confusing in and of themselves, right? And so what we see, if you'll notice, um, I believe I caught this accurately in the notes, but you'll see quote marks around that, which is meaning these are Corinthian phrases. The first one being, everything is permissible for me. For us, That's kind of like the the slogan for Las Vegas. (laughs) What happens in Vegas? It was just a Corinthian phrase that was known, that was understood, and that within the church, Paul wanted to call out a truth of in. Because sexual immorality was one of the main problems that Paul and the early church had to speak regularly truth into. And so he's speaking to them in a time and in a place where you see this excuse. And so we see this spiritual excuse. Oh, I'm so holy. I can handle anything. And so my holiness can handle any sexual immorality because my soul is separate from my body. I'll be okay. And Paul is calling that out. So that's the spiritual excuse. The second is the physical excuse. So food for the stomach and stomach for food. And you're like, yes, of course, that makes sense. That's how you digest food, right? (laughs) It just makes sense. But what they're doing in this Corinthian phrase is making this excuse that just like eating is necessary for my body, it's the same excuse that sexual pleasure is a necessity for my body. It's an ancient way of throwing up your hands and saying, I got to eat. I have have desires that need to be met. Throw your hands up. But Paul is speaking truth into this moment. Those two excuses, is that not something we would hear today? It's no different. (laughs) It's not a new thing. It's as old as time. This idea of excusing our actions. We use these logic, these ways of of treating our body like they're rented vehicles. But the truth of our body is so unified in our soul. It's imperative for us to understand this. And there's been a shift that's even existed or or kind of gotten momentum even since Paul's writing in the 16th century. There became this shift within philosophy from the big questions, the big ones that affect everyone, to very specific and individualized questions where the questions that matter most are individual and personal. And what that began to lead into this postmodern era is this idea that the only thing that matters is my opinion. I get to set my own rules. I get to make my own truth. It's this idea that uh, everything that has to do with the body is bad and the spirit or the soul is good. And then they also do a reverse where everything with the spirit is bad, but everything is physical is good. How it plays out is so different. But there we see this huge chasm that's developed in between our soul and our body. We see this separation playing out. You see this idea of doubt being the pinnacle of intellectualism. Where if you doubt something, it's more valid than having belief in something. Watch any news station right now and you will see that playing out in front of your eyes. But it's impacted us more than I think we ever thought or imagined. If you even just look in our church, we have had a pretty significant number of memorial services in the last 
couple of days. And praise the Lord, everyone has experienced Christ and has salvation, and we have incredible hope for eternal glory. And yet, even in those moments, we have tears and mourning and sadness. Because the Christian perspective of our bodies and our souls are something of unity. There's unity within the Christian perspective of what does it mean for us to be human. But the why we mourn, why there's in great sadness is because the two have been broken in death. In death, the soul is no longer present in the body, no longer present with us as other humans that get to embrace and be in relationship with them. It is just a corpse without a soul, and that is Worthy of sadness. But there's an important reality in this unity because the universal agreement of the Christian church is that we need salvation for our sins, but also a bodily resurrection. Jesus will return and we will be resurrected in the new heaven and the new earth and we'll be given new bodies. Can I get an amen? Amen. No more brokenness, no more sickness, no more miscommunication. Why is that important? Because a part of being made in the image of God is the unity of our soul and our body. Another point is if, if, the, if, if the body was irrelevant, why did Jesus heal so many people? Why didn't he just forgive them of their sins? Jesus cared about the bodily ailments of those that he interacted with. There is a unity within our body and our soul, and we can't excuse our sexual struggles by playing one against the other. Saying we can experience a certain thing or go after a certain thing and it won't affect our souls because it's just a bodily action. God's word doesn't allow for that. Which says, and we're going to see, Paul is going to get a little bit more explicit in his description in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I, shall, shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Let's lean in. This is Paul's home run statement right here. Flee from sexual immorality. For all other sins a person commits outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, Honor God with your bodies. It's that honoring God with our bodies. We see in this statement, we see that God, or uh, that Paul doesn't allow for God to just say that bodies are our vessels, but it's a vessel of the Holy Spirit with us, a temple, the presence of God tangible in this world is through us as followers of Christ. This idea of sexual immorality, or the King James Version uh, says fornication. It is, it's kind of unfortunate because it's, it's a lot more specific than what that might say. is because it's any sex outside of marriage. It's the same phrase, uh, pornonia. It's the same phrase that we get pornography from. It's an explicit media with the goal of creating sexual arousal. It is outside of God's design. It is anything outside of the sexual relationship within marriage. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But we created or have seen this modern dualism of the body and the spirit where it's simply sex has become a transaction, something that can be found with simply a Google search or a go onto a specific app that we probably mostly know. You swipe one way and you pursue 
that activity. It's something that you can find pictures of or explicit material online or in any media. And yet it's stepping outside of what God designs for us to honor him with our bodies. Now, what is the purpose of sexual intimacy? Because once again, sex is more than just a physical act or even the creation or procreation of babies. Sex is a sign of intimacy. That's why when Christ talks about the church as, what is he just, the church is what of Christ? The bride of Christ. There is an intimacy there. There's an opportunity of trust and relationship. Uh, the message translation summarizes this so well in how they describe or uh, translate verse 16 and 17. There is more to sex than skin on skin. Sex is as much a spiritual mystery as a physical act or physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy. Leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. This reduced sexuality not only is harmful to the body, but it never provides genuine joy. It's outside of what God designed. And what we have in our Heavenly Father is someone that doesn't just create rules to be rules. I've fallen into this, this idea as a father of sometimes when my daughters ask why I should do something, or if they, and then I say, because I said so. That's not what God does in this idea of our sexual ethic. He explains why it is not good for us. It does damage to our heart, our bodies, and our souls. But sex within marriage is full of commitment and love and wholeness. And hear me when I say, when I make that statement of marriage, some of you might not have a witness of that reality. Because there is sexual brokenness in marriage as well. And we can talk, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But hear me, the design is accurate. The way we live it out can be flawed. But Tim Keller uh, summarizes this really, really well. He states, sex was created by God as a way for two people to say to one another, I believe, belong to you completely, permanently, and exclusively to you. Isn't that beautiful? That's what commitment allows us to do. But the truth for today as the worship team comes forward is that what we do with our bodies, what we do with our minds, what we do with our souls in the midst of life matters. And not just because God wants to reduce or control you, but he wants your best life for you, full of love, full of grace, full of peace. And so as we lead into this last song, I want to reflect back to the, the devotion leading into communion. This is a moment where we can be like the Samaritan woman, where we can be seen, we can be known, we can be whole. Like I jokingly said before, this is an area where we like to hide and think we can keep things away from our all-knowing Savior. But you are seen, you are known, and you are accepted. So this is obviously just the appetizers we lead into this series. But I encourage you, if the Lord is speaking to you, if you feel just a need to respond to say, God, I need more of you. Our altars are open in this worship time where you can stay in your seats and worship how you lead. But just allow the Holy Spirit to speak and to respond as he guides you. But let us worship in that truth that you are seen, that you are known, 
and that you can be whole. This is not a hopeless battle when the Lord is in it with you. Let us worship the Lord.